I, I think for me, and for many people, happiness has two components. One of them is some degree of security. Am I healthy? Is my family healthy? Do I have enough money to pay the rent? Uh, but at the same time, I want to know, am I using my strengths to do something that matters? And that combination of both the physical security and kind of sense of meaningfulness and purpose on a day-to-day -day level is really what happiness is. Yeah, um, I'm, not sure what, I'm not sure what the missing ingredient is. I have a hunch. Uh, and one of my hunches is that a lot of times these employee programs are very controlling that they don't, have, they don't allow a lot of autonomy on the part of the individuals participating in it. So you have to do well-being a certain way. You have to do well-being a certain time. And that goes again, it's completely antithetical to notions of well-being because a lot of human flourishing is founded on a sense of self-direction. So if I don't have some sovereignty over what I do, how I do it, when I do it, where I do it, who I do it with, then my path toward well-being is gonna be thwarted. So that would be my hunch about why some of these wellness programs have those low levels of engagement. Yeah, well, I mean, happiness is a very freighted word. And a lot of times when people think about the word happiness, they think about um, uh, smiling, enjoyment, at the beach, kicking up sand, running around. And that's, at some level, that's not what happiness is. I mean, Seligman's work um, shows that happiness is actually can be, happiness in its truest sense is often kind of, is quieter than that. It's, it's, it's having a sense of meaning in your life, having a sense of purpose in your life, getting up in the morning and knowing why you're doing what you're doing and recognizing that what you're doing actually makes a small contribution to the world. And so when we think about happiness, we always end up being, we always end up with these visions of kind of beaming smiles, when in fact, there's a broader, you know, I, I, there's a broader notion of happiness out there that is, that is um, a little bit more mellow, which is about, am I doing something that matters? Am I making a contribution to the world? There's, you know, hedonic happiness, and then there's actually a kind of a, a deeper sort of happiness. And I, I think that deeper sort of happiness is, you know, do I have people who love me? Do I have people I love? Am I doing something that matters? Am I using my strengths? Am I making a contribution is really what happiness is, not so much um, a day at the beach. Uh, I'm not a big believer in passion uh, for a couple of reasons. N uh, number one is that you know I think that the um, you know when you when you say to people you know what's your passion, um, I hate that question when it's asked to me because you always have to come up with a really really good answer, you know. And and for me, I'm not sure what it is. Now I know I think it's it's clearer to focus on like what did, what do you do when nobody's watching? What do you do that where you have a flow experience and you lose a sense of time, you lose a sense of self? I think that that gives you some clues about what you should be doing. The other thing about passion is that it's much more, uh, it's so inner-directed. It if you say what's your passion, it becomes all about me, rather than about what is going on in the rest of the world and what I'm, and what I'm contributing. So, um, so I think that focus on, focusing a little bit more in an outward way, what contribution am I making, whose lives am I affecting, is better than, say, is better than asking yourself, what's my passion? As for purpose, you know, I mean, I think that, um, that sometimes we get um, deluded into believing that one's purpose is always perfectly stated at every time in one's life and fixed forever. It's a moving target in many cases. And so one's purpose at age 20 might be very different from one's purpose at age 50, which might be very different from one's purpose at age, at age 80. And so um, I think we have to look at purpose as, as an aspiration rather than the correct answer on a multiple choice test. You know, the whole field of, of academic psychology and academic social science um, didn't even acknowledge happiness or flourishing until 15, 20 years ago. I mean, it was all about dysfunction and disorder. And so I think that academic psychology has really turned the corner and focused on what is it that makes people fulfilled and positive contributors. So I think that's great. And I think that as a consequence of that, uh, it's, rippled into the, it's rippled into the mainstream. So you can have a conversation in mixed company about happiness. You can have a conversation in mixed company about purpose. And I think that's nothing but, uh, I think that's nothing but healthy. If you look at organizations and you look at the research on motivation and performance, what it shows is that 
The, the mainstay motivator that we use in organizations, I call it an if-then motivator, as an if you do this, then you get that. Those are very effective for simple routine tasks with short time horizons, but they're not very effective at all for more complex creative tasks with long time horizons. And we use them for everything. And so, and as more of the workplace migrates toward doing things that require complexity, judgment, discernment, what we're using is a set of motivational mechanisms that are literally from the wrong century. And so if we upgrade our motivational techniques and focus more on paying people well and giving them autonomy, mastery, and purpose, then I think we have, will have done uh, a huge world of good. The other thing that I, that I think is extraordinarily important for people to, to recognize is the research that shows that the single biggest day-to-day -day motivator on the job is making progress and meaningful work. Um, and what we need to do is we need to re-architect our workplaces, to some extent re-architect our own lives, so we can help people see the progress that we're making, help people acknowledge the progress that people are making, remove the barriers to progress. And if we focus our individual lives and our organizations on helping people make progress, then I think it's gonna redound to the benefit of both the individuals and the organizations. But right now, we don't have that. Right now, there, a lot of people feel extraordinarily thwarted in their ability to make progress. And the mechanisms inside of firms do very, very little to uh, encourage or promote progress. I, I think that magazines like Live Happy do a great public service. That is, they take what scientists have found and translate it for regular people into ways that can actually improve their lives. And so, you know, there's so many other magazines out there about about dieting and working out and all of these kinds of purely physical notions of well-being, which, which is fine, but there aren't that many magazines devoted to human flourishing, and so I think the time is perfect for a magazine like this.